recognized that the disproportionate and unique impact of armed conflict on women and girls, the need for the contribution of women and girls to prevent conflict, to support peacekeeping, peacemaking, and sustainable peace building and peace, and to highlight the importance of women's equal and full participation at the table. So much progress has been made since then, and each of our excellent panelists today will both look backwards to think about what's been accomplished, but maybe more interesting also saying where we will go from here. So I am very excited. In a moment, I will introduce each of the four panelists. The way we will structure this is they will try to stick to very quick remarks of only five minutes each, which is difficult on such an important topic. We will then go to a short back and forth between the members of this panel. I will kick that off by a question to them. And then we will open up for our audience discussion. So please think about what you'd like to ask this exceedingly experienced group and send your question in on the, on the chat line here and the Q&A and we will collect those. So without further ado, it is my pleasure and thank you also broadly to our ambassador into the UK for hosting this discussion. So our first panelist will be Ambassador Karen Pierce, who's well known to many. Prior to arriving in DC, Ambassador Pierce was the UK permanent representative to the United Nations in New York, where she served since March of 2018. She is the first woman to represent the UK in both roles. Prior to that, she was the ambassador serving as a director general for political affairs and the chief operating officer of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in London. She has extensive multilateral experience, also serving as the deputy perm rep and ambassador at the UK mission in UN from at the UN, sorry, from 2006 to 2009. And previously, she was also the ambassador and perm rep of the UK mission, the United Nations, World Trade Organization, and other international organizations from 2015 to 2016. She was also ambassador to Afghanistan. So in one moment, we will turn to her for the first set of remarks. Our second panelist today, we're very pleased, is Ambassador Roya Romani. Ambassador Romani is an Afghan diplomat and the first female Afghan ambassador to the United States. She's also the designated non-resident ambassador to Argentina, Mexico, Dominican Republic, and Colombia. She has served in these roles since December of 2018. In 2016, Ambassador Romani was appointed Afghanistan's first female ambassador to Indonesia non-resident ambassador to Singapore and first ever ambassador to the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. In her role as ambassador to the United States, the ambassador has focused on highlighting the successes of um, Afghan American partnership and bringing to the American people the often unheard stories of Afghan everyday life and the steady progress towards peace. She enjoys connecting with and expressing her deep appreciation for American veterans who have served in Afghanistan Having experienced the horrors of war firsthand, the ambassador is strongly committed to building peace. She has said, if I can stop even one bomb from going off, my goal in life will be achieved. Our next panelist is Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, Stephanie Hammond. Uh, Dazzy Hammond serves as uh, the Secretary of Defense for Stability and Humanitarian Affairs and focuses on the management oversight of humanitarian assistance and foreign disaster relief programs, civil affairs, embassy security, crisis response policy and coordination, as well as international humanitarian human rights law and policy, stabilization authorities, UN peace operations reform, training, and the DOD personnel at the United Nations. Previously, Dazdi Hammond served as the World Vision Humanitarian Policy Advisor, where she focused on the global refugee crisis and complex humanitarian emergency response. Before working on international NGO, she was a foreign policy advisor in the US Congress for over five years, focused on emerging national security challenges, human rights, rule of law, and a wide variety of issues, including State Department and the oversight of the US Agency for International Development. And then finally, and certainly not last, but not least, Ambassador Milan Brevere. Ambassador Revere is the Executive Director of the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security, she also serves as a special representative on gender issues for the OSC chairperson in office. Ambassador Revere previously served as the first US ambassador for global women's issues, position to which she was nominated by President Obama in 2009. 
She coordinated foreign policy issues and activities relating to the political, economic, and social advancement of women, traveled to nearly 60 countries. She worked to ensure that women's participation and rights are fully integrated into US foreign policy. And she played a leadership role in the administration's development of the US National Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security, 1325. President Obama also appointed her to serve as US representative to the UN Commission on the Status of Women. So as I noted, this is an exceptional panel. So I'll turn first to you, Ambassador Pierce. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Victoria, and thank you to uh, all the fellow panelists, really uh, distinguished women. Uh, so thank you for everything you've done uh, for this very important agenda item. Uh, I can be brief, Victoria, because I think the message is, is very simple. Uh, there have been 20 years uh, of action. We all know that peace has a better chance if women are at the table from the start. Uh, but we still don't see enough implementation of all the commitments uh, we sign up to. And I think that's, that's really uh, key. And we can't scrutinize enough uh, this issue uh, of implementation. Uh, one of the things the UK is trying to do to, to aid that implementation, uh, we help fund the International Civil Society Action Network so that we can develop a protection framework for women peace builders. Uh, and we're looking all the time uh, for those sorts of practical uh, suggestions on what we can do. As far as getting women actually to the peace table goes, I do think we've made progress. Uh, when I was working on Syria uh, in 2012, when I was in Geneva, uh, the UN were very resistant, amazingly, uh, to including women in the talks, but that would not happen now. Uh, the UN would be at the forefront, but I think there's still a gap in a lot of countries about accepting that women should be at the table from the start. So part of what the UK does is try and make that happen uh, through development assistance, uh, through funding. Uh, so fundamentally, I think that's, that's the message uh, from, from me. We need to think about how we can get more implementation in this important area. Uh, and I will stop there because um, the other panelists have, have many more uh, things that they should say, I think, and, and we should hear from them. Thank you. Thanks so much for kicking off the discussion. Um, Ambassador Romani, over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Assalamu alaikum. May peace be upon you. It's such a great pleasure to be here today alongside such a distinguished panel to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the UN Security Resolution 1325 and uh, the uh, protection and empowerment of women and girls. Thank you to my dear friend, Ambassador Pierce, for hosting this event and uh, to you, Ms. Oholtz, for moderating. This is a topic very near and dear to me uh, because when the resolution was adopted, I was coming off age uh, and prospects for my country were bleak. In fact, the situation for women was so dire uh, uh, during that time that uh, the UN Security Resolution 1325 was developed in part with the horror in Afghanistan in mind. However, since 2001, millions of lives have been changed, including my own. Uh, it is because of the values outlined in this resolution that I am able to be here um, in front of you sitting today. Women were enabled to reclaim their voice. But uh, if you're only looking at the past 20 years, that would be a very narrow way uh, to look at the history. There has been a consistent pattern throughout Afghanistan's history that women, that when women were empowered, Afghanistan thrives and vice versa. From 15th century, uh, when Queen Gawarshad 
who was a minister and led a cultural renaissance to our very own Joan of Arc, Malala of Maiwan, who made a flag from her veil before leading men um, uh, into battle in 1880s to the uh, Afghan women receiving the right of vote in 1919. Yes, a year before the women in the United States were allowed to go to the polls. Afghan women have a long history of using their strength and ability to fight and improve Afghanistan. Let me fast forward and bring you to present with this uh, story. One woman, her name is Latifa Nabizada, encapsulates what a generation of Afghan women experienced. In 1991, when Latifa was only 18 years old, she and her sister graduated from helicopter flight school, becoming Afghanistan's first ever women pilots. Later the same year, the civil war began. During the dark ages of Afghanistan that followed that year and lasted for a decade. What happened to these women? Can you imagine going from experiencing the freedom of flying to being trapped behind a veil and only being allowed to see the world through the little chambers of a burqa? Achieving your dream of becoming a pilot, then being haunted down forever having that dream. Fortunately, once democracy was restored, Latifa became a colonel in 2013 and is still flying. While we still have a lot of work to do, we are fortunately again seeing women, pilots, leaders, activists emerging again, more influential than ever. For many members of the current Afghan government, women empowerment is personal. His Excellency President Ghani often says that we, he thanks his mother and grandmother who were both strong women for his commitment to women's empowerment and women's rights. A government's recognition of the strength and power women have is critical because UN security uh, resolution of 1325 does not just talk about protecting women from violence and conflict. It talks about empowering them as well. Afghan women cannot just be viewed as victims. They must be viewed as latent power, as an opportunity for growth, as a chance for peace, because they are. It has been made clear time and time again that women's involvement is not a nicety but a necessity in order to forge durable peace. We must keep women involved every step of the process. They should be involved from the design of a deal to the sustainment and institutionalization of peace. Most importantly, they need to be allowed to create a culture of peace. Given women's ability to negotiate every day with their children and husbands and everyone in between, they are clearly natural negotiators and keepers of stability in society. Why not let them take a shot at the peace process as well? I thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Very much appreciate that. Next, I'll turn to Dasky Hammond. Well, thank you so much, Victoria, and thank you to Ambassador Pierce and to the British Embassy for convening this important event today to celebrate the 20th anniversary of this landmark UN Security Council resolution on women, peace, and security. What a remarkable group of panelists, and I'm so honored um, to be here today. Resolution 1325 offers us a moment to reflect on the progress we've made implementing the WPS mandate over the last two decades and to also contemplate the challenges we still face and how we can tackle them together. 
I'm looking forward to today's discussion and to hearing more about the outstanding global momentum around the WPS initiative, especially within the UK and Afghanistan. Thank you as well for inviting a Department of Defense representative to speak more about our WPS implementation. We here at DOD strongly support the whole of government engagement with WPS and view WPS as essential to our own national security. Three years ago, last October, the United States passed the WPS Act, which required a whole of government strategy on WPS, as well as implementation plans for each implementing department and agency. This past summer, DOD released its first ever WPS strategic framework and implementation plan, which laid out our priorities for the next four years. Now, there is a relationship between our own ability to implement the intent of the WPS mandate abroad and how we organize, train, and equip our own forces. And our plan acknowledged the need for the department to model and employ the WPS principles it advises other partner nations to uphold. This includes ensuring we continue to pay careful attention to the composition of our personnel and the development of our engagements with partner nations, including joint exercises, training, operations, and war planning. Our plan details three overarching defense objectives to orient the department's implementation of the U.S. strategy and WPS, which are First, DOD exemplifies a diverse organization that allows for women's meaningful participation across the development, management, and employment of the joint force. Second, women and partner nations meaningfully participate and serve at all ranks and in all occupations in the defense and security sectors. And finally, partner nation defense and security sectors ensure women and girls are safe and secure and that their human rights are protected, especially during conflict and crisis. This plan will support and advance the department's ongoing activities to implement WPS, including training personnel and design finding engagements with partner nations focused on these WPS principles that are so important. Now, at DOD, we know that advancing the WPS mandate provides us with a unique engagement opportunity to further strengthen our relationships with our allies and partners so we can collectively reinforce force women's empowerment, meaningful participation in decision-making, protection from violence, and access to resources. We also recognize the tremendous efforts that have been made by our partners and allies, including those here on this call today who carry this mantle forward. Thanks in large part to the robust congressional support we've received, the department currently has a network of active WPS advisors and subject matter experts stationed everywhere throughout DOD, whether it's the Office of the Secretary of Defense, the Joint Staff, the um, Defense Security Cooperation Agency, and um, finally at nearly all of our combatant commands. These personnel are the backbone of our WPS implementation within the department and lead DOD's WPS engagement with partner nations. For instance, they advise and train senior leaders, commanders, and staff about how to integrate gender perspectives and WPS principles into policies, plans, operations, and partner nation engagements. To date, we at DOD have worked with more than 50 partner nations to demonstrate the value of this type of work and to um, also share best practices and lessons learned on recruitment, retention, employment, um, promotion, just to name a few of women serving um, in our military. These engagements have included conferences, training events, um, and workshops, and also integration of WPS principles into joint military exercises. One great example that I wanted just to briefly highlight, and I'm happy to go into more detail later, is um, our engagement with African Command AOR with uh, Niger. Their DOD is working to help their armed forces adapt their recruitment methods to increase the number of women in their ranks and to promote women into more leadership positions. Niger, of course, is an important partner in the fight against terrorism. Due to, due to growing operations, 
operational demands and the gendered impact of um, armed conflict in the region. There is a disproportionate amount of displaced women and girls, for instance. The Nigerian Armed Forces has determined the need for a more diversified force. And they're working with the United States to find more effective ways to recruit female personnel. As a result of their dedication um, to this effort, Niger has already made outstanding progress. Women in their armed forces are increasingly represented in roles such as pilot, pilots, aircraft maintenance officers, and supply officers. For example, at their basic training school, they've increased their female recruitment numbers from 10 to 300 in just the span of one year. And Niger's Air Force now has its first female pilot who is trained by the United States as part of a program to fight Boko Haram. She is now an operational squadron commander and has conducted multiple combat deployments. Another um, example that I'll highlight briefly is with Burma in the Indo-Pacific um, AOR, where our WPS advisors are planning to host a workshop with individuals from the Burmese government, parliament, political parties, civil society organizations, and the security sector with the objective of highlighting the importance of women's participation in the peace and security process. This workshop will demonstrate to the Burmese government how women's participation, empowerment, and safety is crucial to their um, continued um, peace and uh, stability in that country. This engagement demonstrates how working with partners on WPS can offer the Department a low threat opportunity to continue the US partnership with Burma and strengthen the network of um, strategic partners in the competition continuum, all while advancing the objectives laid out in the WPS Act strategy and our implementation plans. Our bilateral engagements um, focus on fostering long-term, transparent, and inclusive relationships that help countries build up their own capacity on WPS and their security forces, and in turn, advance their own national security. Through our military-to-military -military relationships, we encourage our allies and partners to promote women's active and meaningful contributions to their security sectors so that their militaries can similarly benefit from the diversity of ideas and talent brought to bear when men and women work together. Now, I would be remiss um, to talk about this without also highlighting a few of the challenges that DOD um, has faced over the years um, since the release of our first national action plan in 2011. Um, and I'm happy to go over these more during the Q&A, but just to highlight some of the top three challenges that we faced and then how um, we're ta tackling them here at the department. So first, um, in order to ensure our WPS programs are sustained and supported, we're working to further institutionalize WPS across the department by integrating WPS into our policies, plans, doctrine, training, and education, and encouraging our senior leadership to support WPS within their own chain of command. To this end, we're working to sustain and build out our network of WPS subject matter experts across the department. And this includes subject matter experts everywhere from OSD policy, where I sit, um, down to our combatant commands. Finally, in recognizing how important and impactful it is to engage with our allies and partners in this um, critical initiative, we are working to further integrate WPS principles into our U.S. security cooperation guidance, training, and activities with partner nations. Um, in conclusion, we've made a tremendous amount of progress on WPS since Resolution 13. 25 was passed 20 years ago. Um, and we have the opportunity, the momentum, and the capacity here at DOD to carry out this work much further. And we're very much um, looking forward now that we have our WPS implementation plan to um, go into ac further action mode within the department in our collaboration with the rest of the inner agencies and allies and partners on this. I look forward to answering your questions and continuing to work with you all on this important initiative. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very much appreciate the specifics about what the U.S. and the U.S. Department of Defense are working on. Helpful. Um, 
Ambassador Veer, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. And let me also add my great thanks to my good friend, Ambassador Pierce, uh, for bringing us together. It's a reunion of sorts for me because I've had the great privilege to work with everybody participating in this event. Uh, and in many ways, that statement says a good deal about where we've come and where we're going. And if I might for a moment, I wanna go back because 10 years ago uh, for the 10th anniversary of the Women, Peace and Security uh, Act at the United Nations, then Secretary Clinton uh, made a statement. Uh, and in the process, she talked about what we're still discussing and what, something that is still very critical. And that is that if we are going to reduce conflict and truly advance peace, we need all of our people engaged, women and men, in peacekeeping, peace building, post-conflict reconstruction, which is literally what 1325, that resolution that we are marking also now uh, is about. And when we were in New York for her about to make her statement, I will give you a little anecdote. We were talking about what she was going to say, and she was going through her remarks. She had been very engaged on this issue. As secretary, she was prodding us all the time to fully integrate 1325, which the United States supported since its enactment, more fully in our policies. And she had been at the UN the year before to introduce resolution 1888 that went to the heart of addressing sexual violence and conflict something our colleagues in the UK have led very aggressively on. And she said, well, are we doing enough? Why aren't we announcing a national action plan? And at that moment, many of us who wanted to do a action, national action plan said, well, that's a mighty fine idea, but you're about to go out and make your speech. We called no less than Victoria Halt, who was in the State Department at the time working on international uh, affairs vis-a-vis -vis the UN especially, and said, can you make sure we have clearance to do this? And our government people here will understand clearance. And in rapid fashion, she signed off, she got the White House to sign off, and the secretary went in to make her announcement. That announcement, interestingly enough, was two parts. One part was to announce further assistance to women in Afghanistan because from the very beginning, we were very focused on Afghanistan, the role women had to play, uh, that the process had to be participatory, inclusive, and that their leadership was critical. And that was a constant battle. And so she was announcing additional resources for Afghan women. And then she said, there is another part to our announcement. And that is that the United States is going to undertake putting together a national action plan on women, peace and security. There had been some 30 countries ahead of us uh, at that point, but we were then in business to really go full force on putting this together. It was the process centered in the White House uh, under the leadership of Samantha Power at the time. And it involved the Department of Defense, Department of State, uh, USAID, our assistance programs and Homeland Security. Uh, that plan was enacted at the end of 2011. And when President Obama announced it, he didn't just announce a presidential directive because our colleagues from the Department of Defense, and now you heard what, what, where they are with Stephanie's remarks, our colleagues in DOD said to us, make it an order because DOD will understand an order. So it was accompanied by an executive order, not just a presidential directive. And President Obama said, this means we are going to do our diplomacy differently, our defense work differently, our assistance work differently, our development, because we are going to integrate gender, the gender perspective, the gender lens into those considerations. Now that's easier said than done. Uh, we have worked uh, all of these years later uh, at continuing to move that agenda forward. We can go in in this discussion uh, to talk about some of the obstacles uh, and difficulties. Today, there are 90 national action, action plans. Uh, there is much more awareness of this. 
Uh, the United Nations is much more engaged. This Secretary General uh, is putting a lot more emphasis on the role of the peace envoys and other uh, aspects of the UN into this uh, framework that is critically important. Uh, but given all the work at the, at the State Department, and I think one of the challenges always to understand this just as a marginal framework. It's not just something that stands on the sidelines. It has to be fully integrated. And that means fully integrated in all of the conflict areas, the fragile states, every place we're working where this really needs to be injected. Again, that's easier said than done, but that became one of the para paramount um, messages and actions that we needed to take uh, going forward. Uh, it meant working more closely with allies and friends and, uh, in, and assisting states that were adopting their own national action plans so that we could work uh, as support mechanisms with them. Uh, and, and in the process uh, of all of this, uh, we come to today where this national action plan evolved into a law, the first law in the world, uh, the Women, Peace and Security Act uh, that Congress passed. And just as in the national action plan, we needed indicators and measurements to ensure that progress was occurring, the, the law also has those uh, measurements, uh, guidelines that have been put out, congressional oversight that will happen. And today there is a, a caucus of legislator, legislators in the US Congress, the Women, Peace and Security Caucus. So there has been considerable action since 10 years ago, but interestingly, we are still moving that forward. Uh, we are still uh, focused on Afghanistan and the critical um, activities that are going on now in Doha and whether or not this peace process uh, will move the needle forward for peace and an end to violence uh, and the engagement of women at all levels of Afghan society. So I will just end there, but I think it is uh, tremendously illustrative in many ways that 10 years ago, we were marking an anniversary. We used the anniversary to advance the US National Action Plan, start the process. And with Stephanie's presence, you have in many ways, uh, the, the uh, continuation of the process exactly in ways it's being uh, implemented today at DOD especially. Uh, and with Ambassador Rahmani, we have the continuation of the hard work on Afghanistan and the participation of women. And with Ambassador Pierce and all of the work that the UK has done, both as a critical friend of Afghanistan, her own work in Afghanistan and her government's work on ending sexual violence and conflict. So there is something about this uh, that uh, is highly um, illustrative and serendipitous in some ways uh, that we've all gathered on this very issue. Thank you so much for a, a, a wonderful bringing together of the different themes. What I'd like to do is pose sort of a broad question and ask who would like to take a part of it. And then I already see some good questions queuing up. So I'll do my one round. I've heard a few themes. So I'm gonna give you an opportunity to maybe pick something to go a little deeper on. Of the three, one, we have real cases where this has been better integrated. You know, the stories used to be primarily, say, Liberia, but increasingly Colombia. And there's ambitions in Afghanistan, in Yemen, in South Sudan. So I'd love one, one of my three back to you would be, does anyone have an example of where you think this has been making progress? And particularly Afghanistan is a case where we're all concerned. And I saw the recent open letter saying that now the peace talks are beginning and Ernest Morse, how do you make sure that women are a full partner in that? And I welcome thoughts on that. The second, as ICANN's been mentioned, and there's an increasing effort by civil society to not just advocate, which is important, but to break down a process that can better involve women from the beginning and all the way through to the stable peace. Everything from rapid response and help with visas to consultations, as well as how to get women at the table without putting themselves in harm's way 
if they're fighting or putting themselves counter to the powerful elites who may not like all the message yet, that message is so critical. So the second area is if anyone, I think also the UK has been one of the supporters of the on ICANN network uh, and also Ambassador Revere, I know you are deeply involved with civil society, if you had thoughts on that. And the third is obviously in the research area. And I will note that the Georgetown Institute that Ambassador Revere runs just put out a report either today or this week, looking at the data and the frequency of gender provisions and peace agreements, 1990 to 2019. So we're seeing increasing deepening and understanding of not the, just the aspiration, but what it looks like in practical terms. And if I understand your report correctly, Ambassador, it says it's been up and down and we had a high watermark in 2013, a dip, and now it's slightly better. But really getting our arms around the data also would get to what Dazzy Hammond was talking about is policies, plans, training, and purposeful efforts to fix structures. So I throw those three topics out. Um, I'll, I'll offer Ambassador Pierce the first comments and then if you like to go next, if you could just wave your human hand at me, I'll, I'll turn to you next. Thanks. Uh, well, thanks very much, uh, Victoria. And I loved uh, Milan, I loved the way you ended uh, your intervention, bringing us all together as, as Victoria said. I mean, I hesitate to uh, comment on the individual countries because Roya uh, is much better placed to talk about Afghanistan. Uh, although I have to say it is actually the only question I could answer uh, with any degree of, of expertise. Um, I will just say that I always remember a story told to me uh, when um, we were working on this in, in the UN in 2009, uh, Victoria, which was about an aid programme. It may well have been one of our aid programmes. Uh, and it built a well uh, for the women. And it was meant to be a huge step forward uh, for the village. But the women had to walk through the woods to get to the well. Uh, and the woods were dangerous and full of men who attacked them. And therefore, they wouldn't go to the well. And when asked uh, why not, they explained that nobody had asked them where they wanted the well to be built. That's a very small example, but it's easy to see how it completely encapsulates uh, the nature of the problem. You don't get the result you want. Uh, if you don't have women in at the ground floor. Uh, I'll stop there. That, that's an excellent point. I'll just note that uh, the data and an understanding of conflict, there's a wealth of understanding that those involved in it have. And to your point, we see that time and again. If you want to know who the perpetrators are, ask the women. Um, Ambassador Revere, over to you. Well, to follow up on what Ambassador Pierce just said, I think it's an absolutely critical point and important to our understanding of why, and that's sp specifically for decision makers and policy makers. And that is because men and women experience conflict and security differently. And so we have to factor in those differences in order to achieve the goals that we want to achieve overall. Uh, and I'll, any of these areas are just, uh, could keep us going for hours, but let me start with uh, the research point because often there is a massive gap between researchers and the kind of work that goes on uh, in think tanks and academia and policymakers and decision makers. And I often felt in honesty sitting at the table uh, that never the twain shall meet. Part of government is always doing everything the same way whether it works or not, but that's what we were taught to do and that's what works. And I remember one day being in Afghanistan and uh, one of the Afghan women who I didn't know at the time, but is Orza Lanimut, who many of us know now, she actually runs a think tank in Afghanistan today. And she said to me, stop looking at us as victims and look at us as the leaders that we are. And I thought to myself coming back around the big mahogany table in the State Department, we're discussing Afghanistan and if the women come up, they come up as victims, what can we do to help them? And not really thinking in terms of the roles that they can play uh, to move the agenda forward that we all shared. Uh, so in leaving the State Department, uh, one of my great frustrations was that we didn't have that evidence-based case uh, in spades, if you will, that research and data that would show policymakers in an accessible way not a pedantic way, an accessible way, 
why this makes a difference. Because in the end, I think everybody in government wants to be effective in carrying out the goals. And the, the goal in this case was enable our decision makers to be more effective. If they saw how women peace negotiators make a difference, they would understand the push for women peace negotiators, for example. Or they saw in that transition from ending conflict to building peace, uh, why in reconstruction, women in the economy, women in politics, et cetera, need to be factored in if there's going to be a sustainable peace. So at Georgetown, for example, the kinds of studies we've undertaken focus on the different ways women have influenced peace. Sometimes it's directly at the table. Sometimes it's on these track two or track three levels in the parlance. It's the peace builders on the ground who are actually negotiating in ways on the ground, crossing divides, having a lot of intel about what needs to be done, but that track never meets the official track. We've got to do better at putting the two together. And then the role that women have played uh, where mediators have reached out to the women and brought their advice and counsel into the official meetings where it might not get otherwise. So just this whole area of how, given what has occurred, it has made a difference. Um, about three years ago, we issued the first Women, Peace and Security Index. And what we looked at was the condition of women on three dimensions. So there's inclusion, uh, which is access to education, political participation, economics, et cetera. But we added justice, discriminatory practices, and security. Are they secure in their own homes? Are they secure in their communities? And then ranked over 160 countries. And the countries that are mired in conflict, the countries that are unstable, are the countries where the well being and condition of women is worst. And we have to understand that the condition and well being of women goes hand in hand with the condition of nations. You cannot go on making policy and making decisions without really factoring in the condition of women. So, this evidence based case needs to be more ingrained in how we make our decisions. We have to bridge theory and practice and do a much better job on understanding why. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And I, I'll turn to Ambassador Romani, but I will briefly note that the research you've done also includes looking at each of the US 50 states, if anyone's looking for applications here at home. Ambassador Romani, over to you. Uh, thank you. I echo uh, what is uh, just being said, the great explanation and examples. And I, just to add to that, I would say uh, that uh, uh, for the meaning for participation to really take root, women must come from periphery to the center. And for that to happen, we need to break a cycle. What is that cycle? The cycle is that women or usually not a party to a conflict. They don't hold guns, they don't hold, uh, uh, necessarily they are not really uh, leaders of the parties and they are not perpetrators of the violence that we are trying to find a settlement and uh, resolution to. So therefore uh, it is, they are usually, uh, the entire issue of women participation turns to a subject rather than a party in the negotiations and peacemaking then would, that would define how peace building and peace management would take root. Like the example that Ambassador Pierce gave, that the well, the women wanted the well, but it was not where they wanted, so it was useless. This, this is the, the, the same thing. And how to break that cycle? The reality is, and um, excuse me if, if I'm putting it this way, but unfortunately, always there needs to be some source, source of pressure to break such cycles, whether it has been true quotas, whether it has been um, conditions uh, put in place, whether it has been a certain conclusion, whether it has been framework drawn before, 
to require something as the cornerstone and, and the basis that the parties cannot move from that. Other than that, then having them uh, continue to be having side events and making statements, which are all very important, but honestly not sufficient and not truly representative of their views. Indeed, not sufficient. Thank you. Uh, Dazzy Hammond. I'll be very quick and just highlight a few areas that DOD is um, supporting a few key partner nations. Afghanistan State Department is taking the lead on the Afghan peace process, as we know. But as far as DOD um, support, we're lending support to the tune of um, at least $10 million um, to work with the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces. Um, this includes everything from recruitment, integration, ret um, retention, training. Um, initiatives through Resolute Support, too, we're working with their ministries of defense and interior on recruitment and retention um, initiatives, including um, professional development training and language skills. And then um, We've also put significant resources into the construction of separate facilities um, for Afghan women serving in their militaries. And this includes everything from barracks, bathrooms, child um, care centers. Um, and then we're also helping to support the um, salaries of these women who are both serving both in the military and the police forces in Afghanistan. There's still, as everyone um, on this call knows, much more work to do, um, but I'm very proud of DOD's engagement um, and look forward to um, further work with our key partners there. Columbia too, um, Victoria, you had mentioned that is uh, being another shining example in the Southcom AOR. I'd certainly agree with you on that. Um, our combatant command, Southcom, has put significant resources into helping our Colombian partners um, and are really working with them to have a strategic partnership on WPS. So this is in, in addition to State Department's engagement um, with them on their national action plan. Um, Admiral Fowler, um, our combatant commander at Southcom, has made frequent visits to his Colombian counterparts to highlight the important role of women's participation. One thing we've highlighted with Columbia up to this point too is that senior level participation with um, uh, female members of their forces. Um, and we're working with them too right now on data collection. So they have um, a very accurate um, number and representation of women in their military. Thank you so much. That's very helpful and, and appreciate the details. Um, I want to turn to the, the, the audience because I'm aware that we do have a hard stop on this discussion. I see a question um, from Amanda Long, who I believe is from the U.S. Institute of Peace. Um, and she asks, what are the major challenges to fully embedding the tenets of 1325 in U.S. foreign and national security policy? Okay, that's a huge question. Um, but she adds, for fun, uh, not so fun, for seriousness, is a feminist foreign policy like that in Sweden a possibility for the United States. So perhaps I could look to my panel to see if somebody in, in only a few minutes, because I, I hope we'll have one more question here, wants to take that one on. So how do we actually fully embed this? And is a feminist foreign policy an option for the United States? Ambassador well, I'll, I'll start. I, I think fully embedding it is a work in progress. It do, it's not gonna happen overnight. We're at a different place than we were 10 years ago, but we've got a long way to go. Uh, it is going to take education. It's going to take experience. It's going to take leadership. I think one of the most important elements in any ministry, in any government department in the United States where this is being integrated has got to come from the top. If the top isn't interested in this, very little is going to happen with people in low and mid-level positions trying to make things happen. Uh, so that's first and foremost. You have to have leadership that really uh, believes in it and executes it, and it comes from the top. Uh, and then in terms of feminist foreign policy, I think we had the beginnings of, a, of that. We would not call it a feminist foreign policy because it just wouldn't get us very far in the United States. Uh, but really what feminist foreign policy means 
is integrating a gender lens into all of the foreign policy considerations, whether it's the economics department, whether it's conflict and stability, whether it's human rights, whatever, which is what we certainly attempted to do and hopefully to some degree is still uh, happening. But it also means resources uh, and it means a real commitment uh, in this area. So yes, I think it's possible. Uh, I think it actually was in progress uh, and I hope we will accelerate that progress. Thank you very much. Let me add another question and uh, I wanna warn Ambassador Pierce, I may see if she wants to tackle this one. It comes from um, Stacy Schamber, who I think maybe if I can, what would you recommend governments and multilateral institutions do to recognize women peace builders and ensure their inclusion in track one level peace processes. So I, not to pick on you, but with your experience at the United Nations, it might be one that you have some observations on. Sure, thanks very much. Um, I think the first thing to do is for the Secretary General to make it very clear of his envoys and his special representatives that that's what he expects them to do. Now, Guterres has done that, uh, but I remember a time, as I was saying on Syria, uh, when that very sadly wasn't the case, uh, even though the women took themselves to Geneva to take part in the, the peace talks. Uh, but I think now the UN has come a long way itself on this. So I think it needs to be done at each agency level, to, to be honest. I think there are still some agencies, as opposed to UNHQ, uh, that don't adequately do this. It's all in the mandates, but it doesn't actually happen. Uh, and it's obviously incumbent on countries like mine and uh, the US and Afghanistan and others uh, to enable participation through fundamentally funding it, but not just funding it, standing guard over it, for want of a better word, you know, making sure that if we say, right, we're going to fund this participation, we're holding people to account uh, for making sure the women can get there, all the things Stephanie was talking about that make it easy, easier for them to participate. Uh, and we um, protect that process by um, continuing to watch uh, how it's going and being ready to offer advice uh, if there's a problem. And I don't actually see any other way, unfortunately, uh, than, than doing something very practical uh, and basic like that, because I think it's true that since 2000, the year 2000, uh, we actually haven't made that much progress on increasing the proportion uh, of women taking part in peace processes. Uh, so I think that's important. Um, it's possible that thinking of something like a buddy system uh, would be helpful. You know, there's Milan's organization, there's one not dissimilar uh, in London, there's um, several organizations within Afghanistan, uh, it may be that we should have some cross-fertilization uh, so that where it has been successful, uh, groups of women coming through in a different peace process can draw uh, on that support. And then lastly, uh, I'd say, and again, this is a Syria uh, example, uh, you need to have genuinely representative groups uh, in the Syria example, there was an issue of who came from within the country and who came from the diaspora. And it's all too easy for other participants to say, well, that group's not representative. So you do have to watch that. And I think that's the case of helping the UN uh, or the OSCE or whoever it is, uh, bring truly representative groups together and then helping those groups become a coherent whole, even if they have different perspectives. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I hate to cut this off, but we do have a hard stop. And I just think that the, the conversation is so rich that we could go on quite a bit. Let me note, um, there's been some excellent material posted in the chat box. And I might suggest to our colleagues at the embassy that maybe we could collect that and make that available uh, for the That's others who participated. My understanding is that the embassy ambassador, you and your team will also post this. And so it's something that we could consult and also share with our networks. Uh, and maybe this will continue to deepen as we go through the next few months, if not the next year. And again, I, I hate to bring this to a close. I have a lot more and I think our other panelists could have said a great deal more, but it's been an honor to participate with you all. 
Um, it's very exciting, the work that's been done, and also very exciting at the ambitions for the future and the, the core logic of the issue, which is, please, half the population is worth engaging because they will help solve the very problems of peace and security that we all, we all remain concerned with. So thank you again to um, the British Embassy for putting this together and for hosting us today. And thank you, everybody. Thanks for your participation. Appreciate it. Thank you, Victoria. And yes, we'll post it all. Thank you. Excellent. Bye bye. Thank you all. Thank Thanks you, Victoria. Everybody. Good to see you. Nice to see everybody. Thank you, Desi. Thank you, Ambassador Armani. Bye.